welcome everyone to this new solo D&D series of videos. In this series, I will be playing various different tabletop RPG systems and settings. These will be short one-shot adventures of just a few episodes each. We are starting with The Wild Sea, a new game system released just last year. The Wild Sea gives a unique setting of a world in which nature has reclaimed the land from civilization. Some 300 years ago, the empires of the world were toppled by a wave of fast-growing greenery, a tide of rampant growth spilling from the west. This event, the Verdant Sea, gave rise to a titanic expanse of rustling waves and sturdy boughs known as the Wild Sea. This is a low-magic, high-weirdness world, full of unusual creatures, woken spirits and unbelievable abilities, but all tangibly connected to the waves of the wild forest. The gameplay is based on a D6 dice pool system. Characters use edges, skills and advantages given by their bloodline, origin and role to build up a D6 dice pool. The outcome of the role can lead to triumph, conflict or disaster, as well as a twist if a double is rolled. In this adventure, we follow a party of wild sailors in their travels aboard the ship the Damselfly, a uniquely designed trimaran for skimming the surface of the wild sea. They're about to embark on their first archaeological expedition to retrieve relics from the pre-Verdancy era in a bid to understand the truth about what happened to their planet. We join our wild sailors on the eve of their maiden voyage as each of them prepares for the journey ahead. Orcus is below decks in the research lab studying the items of salvage that the four crew members have brought on board. The battered bronze locket from the Ectus Gert catches her attention and she decides to investigate it further for possible archaeological interest. So let's roll some dice to find out how successful she is at detecting the locket's secrets. Orcus approaches the investigation with instinct, which gives her an edge when it comes to intuiting something. She uses her sense skill in which she has two points, which enables her to detect and gather information. Finally, having the ardent bloodline, she is able to draw on her ghost sight aspect, which allows her to communicate with spirits. This gives us a 4d6 dice pool. We roll the dice and we get a 6, double 4 and a 2. The 6 means the investigation is a success with no drawback. Presence of the two 4s means we get a twist, which in this context confers some sort of additional advantage. Then we're going to roll on keywords to find out what information the bronze locket yields. We get the words loot, friend, boy and bones. On the outside, this looks to be just a battered bronze locket. Orcus studies it and finds that there are two narrow discs in the seam of the rim. On turning these to line up, the locket springs open. Inside, the piece is very different. It is lined with a precious metal, probably old gold. On one half is a faded picture surrounded by an inlay of fine sparkling jewels. On the other half, there is an inscription. Orcus focuses on it through a combination of studying the inscription in the picture, as well as using her intuition and ghost sight. She sees that this is a picture of a handsome young man with an inscription to My Beloved. She senses that this item has been sought after as valuable loot, maybe stolen, passed through many hands. She also senses a ghostly presence, asking that this locket be returned to the resting bones of the original owner, the girlfriend of this young man. Orcus smiles at the success of her investigation and then ponders for a moment. She will need to get hold of a map of the Wild Sea to find this location. She could probably ask Shrike to provide one. She leans back in her chair and lets her thoughts wander again to the topic of just what did happen to this planet all those years ago when the Verdant Sea erupted. These thoughts have been an ever-present tug in her mind since she woke up in shock in a piece of amber only a year ago. This successful investigation feels like a good omen though. The very first artifact has yielded excellent information that can direct their first journey. She decides to put the other salvage items away for now. Let's focus on one thing at a time. Meanwhile, Shrike is sitting in the pilot's room with a wide grin on his pearly grey face. Finally, he has his own ship. He has the freedom of the Wild Sea. He empties out the chart box with excitement, already imagining their first journey skimming over the canopy of the Wild Sea. He leaves through the various pieces of chart, ranging from rough sketches on ragged scraps of paper to detailed sea charts. He unfolds the many folded chart and pushes it out as flat as he can on the map table, using his manticle tentacle as a third arm. This map was given to him by his fleet family on leaving home. It covers an area of 300 to 400 miles of Wild Sea, stretching out in all directions from their current location. However, there is a lack of detail on this chart, only their current location and a few major landmarks. 
He decides to use it to map out the locations that they will discover on their journey. He inks in their current position at the southern end of the Rocco Isles boat harbour. At this point, Orcus comes in. Hey, Shrike, can I have a look at your charts, she says. Sure, he answers, and goes to put away the empty map of the Wild Sea to find one with more detail. Wait, that one is perfect, says Orcus. She holds the bronze locket over the chart and to Shrike's amazement, swings it like a pendulum over the map. Suddenly, the locket twirls and seems to tug in a particular direction. It lands with a thud on the map table at a point a bit under 100 miles to the south of their current location. Whoa, what just happened there, says Shrike. The locket has just told us where it needs to go, replies Orcus. What? Shrike raises his eyebrows incredulously. I'm using my ghost sight, says Orcus. There is a spirit telling me where we need to take this locket. This is our first journey. Hmm, I never did get that ghost sight thing, says Shrike, clearly doubtful of what Orcus is telling him. This is what the expedition is about, Shrike. This is why I invited you all to join me. Yeah, sure, says Shrike, but we all have a stake in this ship, in this expedition, right? Let's talk it through with the others at dinner time. Well, if you wish, says Orcus. If anyone has a better suggestion of where we go first, I'm open to hear it. But I have a really strong sense about this one. And with that, she walks out again, leaving Shrike a bit bemused. His own ship, but maybe not the complete freedom he was looking for. He sighs and puts the chart away. He goes into the workshop to put a couple of the papers into the schematics box. He looks over the current equipment to check it all is in order. Only the basics currently in the workshop, but he already has ideas for new items he could craft. He sifts through the salvage box to see what may be possible. He is pleased to see that Orcus has already organised the salvage into sections. Well, that's something. A tidy dredger is a rare find. Usually they just dump everything in the salvage crate and head back out again. But Orcus is no ordinary dredger. There look to be the rudiments of some lighting system here. Maybe that could be the first project. He goes over to the workbench and sees that Orcus has left an ancient engine. Now that looks promising. Although he quickly realises that Orcus is probably more interested in investigating the engine for understanding its history rather than getting it working again for practical use on the ship. Another thing they would need to discuss. He then heads to the engine room. He is smiling again as he checks over the new solar compressor engine. Now this really makes him happy. He pats the glass and metal machine. I'm looking forward to seeing how you perform, girl. He then heads up on deck to check the propellers and sails, as well as doing some final deck maintenance. Flicker is also up on deck, although apparently less focused on work than the rest of them. She is twirling and dancing around the deck in excitement, her brightly coloured wings whirling around her. She is also apparently talking to the squirrel gang, who are chattering wildly back at her. She spots Shrike and comes running over. Oh, you're the ship guy, aren't you? The squirrels are telling me that they need ammunition to be able to defend the ship successfully. You can talk to squirrels, asks Shrike. Again, his credulity is stretched. Well, not exactly, says Flicker, but it's obvious that's what they want. OK, fair enough, agrees Shrike. They do need ammo to be effective. There are some sharpened stones and fragments in the salvage box below deck. They can use those for now. Thanks, says Flicker, and she vaults gracefully down the stairs into the workshop below, her sabre blade glinting in the sunlight with her quick movements. Once below, Flicker pokes around the workshop, looking with excited curiosity at all the stuff that the others have brought. She rummages around in the salvage box before she realises that someone has organised everything into neat piles. Oops, she says as she tries to push things back into some kind of order. She spots the pile of stones and scoops them all up and puts them in her pocket. Her eye is caught by a number of brightly coloured items. The fabric she herself brought, some amber chips, so many possibilities. Already she is designing an outfit in her mind for her next performance. Then she goes over to the alchemy bench, a part of the workshop that she has requested. Not that she's a practiced alchemist, but rather that this is her latest hobby and that she's keen to experiment with it. She claps her hands in delight as she sees her fellow crew members have already placed some items here. Some ceremonial dynamite, like small firecrackers, and some sap which her nose tells her definitely possesses mind-bending properties. She rummages through her own pockets and pulls out a black powder pouch and a length of chain. She places the pouch on the alchemy bench. She considers the chain. Should she put it in the salvage? No, it holds far too many useful possibilities, especially in combat. So she puts it back in her pocket and heads back up on deck. In the galley, Gert is busy away from the activity of all their crewmates. They are happily arranging their larder, organising into fruits and veg, herbs and spices and beverages. No proteins to speak of as yet, but the jagged edge of their trusty jaw spear would soon deal with that. The large swift hawk sitting on Gert's green spiky shoulder lets out a shrill cry. 
Oh yes, and of course you too, Seri, my trusted hunting companion. The bird pecks affectionately at a worn patch in the thick green skin where Gert's left ear might be. They smile, thinking of all the exotic new ingredients that could be yielded on this adventure into the wild sea. They give the simmering, glowing mushroom milkweed stew a quick stir and turn the stove down to a slow cook setting. So we roll some dice to find out how successful is Gert in cooking this meal. They use their instinct to give them an edge with the cooking. As a char, they use their cooking skill in which they have three points. They also have the advantage of their season cleaver aspect and the annotated cookbook item for reference. This gives us 6d6, the maximum possible dice pool. We roll a six and two doubles, so this is success with the twist. Gert cooks up eight servings of the tasty stew and has enough ingredients left to prepare some dried mushrooms and some weed milk. Gert then sticks their long green head out of the galley door and listens for any activity in the workshop to the rear. Finally, the ship below deck is quiet and no one else is about. They duck under the doorway and make their way round to the research lab on the far side of the workshop, ducking again to step in and pushing the door closed behind them. Gert opens up the specimen box and peers in at the few items their crewmates have brought. They carefully take out each specimen one by one and place it on the bench. As they do so, they make a neat note in the specimen journal. They hesitate for a moment over the empty columns of date and time caught, exact location, weather conditions, etc. Hmm, maybe they could ask their crewmates for these details. No, probably not. Still, the empty columns irritate them. They make a note of today's date and the crew member that brought each specimen. They then spend a happy half hour measuring each specimen and writing down the particulars in the journal. With all the tasks now completed, the four crew members gather around the table in the cramped saloon. Hey, Gert, says Shrike, do we have any drink to toast the start of our maiden voyage? Gert nods and fetches a bottle of bark wine from the pantry. They bring it to the table with four small tumblers. They pour out the viscous dark purple liquid and pass the tumblers round. Thanks, Gert, says Shrike, as he lifts his hand to slap Gert on the back, but then very quickly thinks better of that action as he sees the sharp spines just under his fingers. Gert carefully squeezes their large form onto a bench on one side of the table. Orcus and Shrike sit together on the other side, while Flicker flits about the room with momentary sits on a small stool at the end of the table. So everyone, let's raise our glasses to the maiden voyage of a damselfly, the best leaf skimmer on the verdant seas. They all raise their glasses, Shrike tosses his drink back in one gulp, and his tentacles immediately turn a dark shade of plum. Orcus carefully sips hers. Gert extends a green branching finger into the glass and gradually absorbs the fluid. Flicker unfurls her proboscis into the glass and noisily sucks up the liquid. Yes, thank you, Shrike. Orcus clears her throat. I just want to thank you all for trusting in this expedition. And, well, me. We have a fantastic ship here that we've all worked together to create. I'm looking forward to voyaging with you all out on the wild sea. Perhaps we should spend a few minutes introducing ourselves. As you already know, I'm Orcus Amberley. I'm an ardent, and I'm a bit embarrassed to say I only emerged from the Amber a year ago. The others glance at each other. They hadn't realised quite how new to this world their expedition leader is. Orcus continues, however, in that year, I have worked hard to make the necessary contacts and to raise the funds to launch this archaeological expedition. My wish is to find and explore the ancient pre-verdant places of this world, to further the understanding of the world we now find ourselves in. Thank you for joining me on this great journey. Now, who would like to go next? OK, I will. I'm Shrike, Captain, uh, well, navigator of this ship. Whilst I'm Ketron, I was born and raised on ships. There's not much about travelling around the Wild Sea that I don't know. I'm grateful to all of you for supporting the creation of this fantastic ship. I know we're going to have some amazing adventures together. Oh, and if you need anything fixing, I'm your guy. Flicker stands on her stool and flaps her wings importantly. Well, I'm Flicker, and I'm joining this ship because... Well, it's an exciting new adventure, and I was looking around for something new to do. I've crewed on ships quite a lot before, mostly helping out with security. She branches her sword, so if you need anything killing, I'm your girl and she laughs nervously and sits down. Gert clears her throat. I won't stand up, as I don't think I can right now. I'm Gert. Seems like I'm the old wood of this crew. Until not too long ago, I was living happily up on the Ridgeback Settlement, tending to my little sprouts, just like I've done all my life. But the Wild Sea knows no mercy, and it swallowed up our nursery grounds in a blink of an eye last season. So I came to the city looking for work. I saw your notice, Arcus, about wanting to set up an expedition to research the ancient pre-verdancy places, and I thought, now that's just the kind of thing I can lend my experience to. I'll be your char on board, 
but my passion lies in researching how can we all live together in balance on this planet. And speaking of char, I hope you're all ready to eat. Gert lifts the lid of the stew pot sitting on the table and lays a large bowl of steaming mushroom milk lid stew out for each of them. I hope it's not too spicy. There's a pinch of sea spices in it. This is great, says Orkis. What a treat to have a skilled char aboard. Flicker peers at the stew with her large compound eyes. There's a faint luminescent glow emanating from the bowl. Are these glowing mushrooms, Gert? She asks. Yes, Flicker, they are. Well, watch out for the crazy dreams, everyone, says Flicker. It should be fine, says Gert. The milkweed largely neutralises the effect of the mushrooms. Flicker looks at Gert, clearly impressed. This char knows his stuff. It may be a bit lumpy for some, and a bit sloppy for others, says Gert. I'm not used to cooking for such diverse palates. So I see, says Flicker, as she furiously tries to mash her mushrooms into a pulp the fork. They all eat in silence for a few minutes. Then Flicker speaks up. Arcus, can I ask you a question? Sure, Flicker, anything. Ask away. Flicker speaks directly. Arcus, are you ready for this expedition? Orcus flinches, as if experiencing an electric shock. What do you mean, Flicker? Well, you just said you only came out of the amber a year ago. I've heard that amber shark can take years to recover from. Is this the right time to be undertaking this voyage? Orcus looks down and breathes deeply, trying to gather her thoughts and feelings. She looks up again at Flicker. Yes, Flicker, you're right to ask that question. I'm sure all of you may have thought it. The truth is, I don't think you ever recover from amber shock. It's something you learn to live with for the rest of your life. And for me, the best way to live with it is to get out into the world and do something which feels important to me. I totally believe in this expedition. Hopefully my perseverance to raise the support and funds for the ship should speak for itself. Shrike cuts in. Remember, Flicker, the Orcus may be expedition leader, but I'm ship's captain. I know what I'm doing. I will keep us safe. Orcus looks at Shrike, grateful for his words to support her cause, but at the same time feeling undermined by him as he asserts his captaincy of the ship. Shrike smiles back at her supportively, but there's also a hint of triumph in his eyes. Okay, says Flicker, that's reassuring. Good, says Orcus, that's cleared up. So I'd like to talk about our first journey. She holds up the small bronze locket. I have discovered that this locket has an important connection to pre-verdant times, and I have located where it originated from. I want to go investigate there. Gert looks interested. Hey, that's the battered old locket that I brought. Don't tell me it's actually worth something archaeologically. Yes, I believe it is. And it would be great to chat to you about how you came by it as we travel to the location. Hold on, says Shrike. We haven't yet agreed whether this will be our first journey. I think we all need to agree. Okay, does anyone have any other proposals of where we go? asks Orcus. I don't mind where we go, as long as we get out and underway, says Flicker. Being ducked so close to town is giving me cabin fever. And I would be interested in finding out more about that locket soon as I brought it, says Gert. What about you, Shrike? asks Orcus. He seems a bit stumped. Well, there are certain places I'd like to visit, but I suppose this is as good a trip as any for a maiden run. Great, it's settled then. We've pinpointed the location on the map, and it's approximately 80 miles to the south of here. Well, that makes sense, says Gert. My home ridgeback is in that area. Would be good to visit the old place after a year away. Well, that's good to have someone who has some local knowledge of that area, says Shrike. Also, now's a good time to talk about how we'll work together when we're travelling out on a wild sea. I'll be navigating, obviously, but I'll look for support from the rest of you to keep watch. You can take it in turns. Kalani, my scout falcon, will be keeping a lookout and scouting the areas we travel, but you never know with the wild sea what might turn up. Oh, where is Kalani? asks Flicker. I haven't seen her yet. She's up top right now, keeping an eye out. Well, I'll be down here in the galley, making sure there's plenty of food to fill our bellies, or up top doing some hunting with Seri, says Gert. The large swift hawk perched on Gert's shoulder is unmissable, clearly a formidable hunter with a large curving beak and sharp talons. Gert picks up a remaining mushroom from their bowl and hands it to Seri. The bird grabs the morsel and plunges her beak into Gert's finger at the same time. A creamy sap oozes from the wound, which the bird eagerly licks up. Orcus winces. Doesn't that hurt? Not really, says Gert mildly. And the sap is very nutritious for Seri to eat. Oh, and could I request that the rest of you leave the tending and the harvesting of our fruit tree to me? It's a special hybrid that gives several varieties of fruit. I want to make sure we get the best yield from it. Great, says Shrike. Is there anything else we need to sort out this evening? What about when we arrive at an investigation site, says Orcus? I was wondering whether we'd all go down and explore, or whether we would split up. Yeah, good question. Well, I imagine that Gert will want to harvest and hunt as a priority each day. 
Gert nods. And we could also do with a presence back on the ship, says Shrike. So as ship security, Flicker, I'd say that falls to you. Flicker looks disappointed. But won't you need my combat skills in case there's trouble down below? Yes, that's a good point, Shrike, says Orcus. Neither of us are skilled fighters. We would need either Gert or Flicker with us in case we encounter anything hostile. Okay, okay, says Shrike. Orcus and I will be chief investigators as well as scavenging for salvage and specimens. Either Gert or Flicker will accompany us depending on what kind of threat we expect to meet and then the other one will stay up top on board ship. Oh, and we can use our pets to communicate, says Flicker. I could send Mr. Tolly down with a message if there's any trouble, and Gert could send Seri. Mr. Tolly? Both Orcus and Shrike inquire together. Oh yes, haven't you met him? She lifts one wing, and a large flying beetle about the size of a fist buzzes out and lands on the table. He has a face that looks curiously like a cat. Meet Mr. Tolly, he's a Tolly cat. The large insect shakes its shiny wing cases and a cloud of dust rises from the table. Oh, what's that? says Orcus. Oh, that's the best thing about a tally cat. Their scale dust is wonderful stuff. It will give us all resistance from diseases and infections. Now that is helpful, says Orcus. Oh, and I almost forgot. I have to introduce you to Frecky. He's my watch wolf, but he's not great with strangers, so I haven't brought him on board yet. He's probably hunting nearby. Hold on. She heads through the lower deck to the stern of the ship and stands on the underthrash platform and gives a loud whistle. Frecky, come now! After a few moments, there's a rustling and movement in the dense branches behind the ship, and a large white wolf launches itself out of the tangle onto Orcus, nearly knocking her over. He licks her face. Okay, Frecky, be calm now. I have some friends for you to meet. She signals with her hand for him to stand down and walk slowly behind her. She heads back through the cargo bay and workshop into the saloon, making soothing noises all the time to Frecky. As she emerges, the wolf nuzzles past her and growls slightly at the sight of the others in the room. No, Frecky, it's okay. They're friends. The wolf surveys the room, its eyes glinting in the dim light. Wow, says Flicker, what a beautiful creature. You're not going to need any protection from me with him around. Shrike nods. Yeah, a very useful addition to the crew, and he puts a tentative hand out towards the wolf. Orcus raises her hand. Not yet, I think, she says. Give him time to get used to you all. Shrike nods. Well, I think our business is concluded for this evening. Orcus nods in agreement. Yes, let's get an early night, and we'll get underway first thing in the morning. Gert is busy clearing away the last remnants of dinner. Do you need any help? asks Orcus. Oh, no, I'll be fine. You head off to bed. I'll be turning in sharply too, says Gert. Orcus heads up the stairs with Frecky following. As soon as they are out on deck in the cool, fresh evening air, Frecky looks at Orcus, and she gives a nod. Immediately, the white wolf launches himself off the side of the ship, back into the thrash for a night's hunting. He gives a brief howl and is gone. Orcus smiles as she carefully makes her way out on the port wing over to the side hull. She heads down the narrow stairs and into the aft cabin. As each of them turn in for the night, they make a note of one milestone achieved for the day. For Orcus, it's obvious this is a major milestone. The ship is built and fitted, the crew are assembled, and they set stay on their maiden voyage in the morning. This is the result of a year of hard toil, of persevering through all the anxiety and doubts. She has made it. Similarly for Shrike, the achievement of now having his own ship to captain. He was pleased that at dinner he had chosen to assert that he was the captain, not just navigator. This was definitely a major achievement. Flicker says goodnight to the squirrels up on deck, and then launches herself up into the air, spreads her wings and glides gracefully down to the portside hull, and heads down the stairs to the forward cabin. She grins to herself with the delight of the aerial manoeuvre. Once below, she becomes serious. Well, I think I held it together pretty well at dinner, she whispers to herself. This voyage is going to be okay. I know it is. It has to be. She writes in her diary, met the rest of the crew without cracking up as a minor milestone for the day. Gert finishes up in the galley and emerges up on deck, just in time to see Flicker's bold glide across the portside hull. They shake their head, bit ma dat one. They squeeze their large frame up the narrow side stairs to the top deck and sit down carefully on one of the upholsters of benches, trying to avoid puncturing the new material with their spines. They look round all the glowing fruit on the tree trained along the back railing and smile gently. They would enjoy choosing the perfect fruit to harvest in the morning. Yes, this felt good very, very good. They look up at the now completely dark sky and see a single shooting star dropping rapidly to Earth. A good omen, although they don't really believe in such things. They note the minor achievement of speaking more words to more people this evening than they have done in months. They make their way carefully down again and over to the starboard side hull and squeeze into the aft cabin. 
And there, we will leave our wild sailors for now. Tune in again next time as they take the damsel fly out for the first time onto the waves of the wild sea. <laughs>